About three weeks ago, I took my son to a national park for a little weekend hike. We took Highway 410 from Tacoma to Mount Rainier, a place my own father took me to as a child. I wanted my son David, now two and a half years old, to experience the same joy of the wilderness as I did, but I'm pretty convinced he'll be afraid of the woods for the rest of his life. When we arrived on Friday, the weather was clear, and the first signs of spring were finally making themselves known. We walked, or rather I walked with David on my shoulders, for about two, maybe three hours from the parking lot to a small abandoned campsite with a pre-made fire pit. I'm not an overprotective parent, so I let David wiggle around a bit while I set up the tent. Just as I was done and getting ready to unload our three-day supply into the tent, I heard David making some noises from behind me. I recognized the sounds immediately, as they were the kind of noises he usually made when he was excited about something. When I turned around, I saw that he was sitting in the grass about 20 meters away from me, looking into the woods. What was even weirder, he was doing what he does when he's particularly excited about something. He was repeatedly slapping his thighs. I slowly approached him, trying to keep my eyes on both him and the forest at the same time, but I couldn't see anything in the tree crowns. When I was finally near him, I asked him what he saw, to which he replied the following, Monkey man, monkey man. He was smiling, still slapping his thighs, and as much as I tried to match his enthusiasm as a good parent should, suddenly the serenity of the forest was replaced by a sense of unease. I fixed my eyes on the tree line and very, very cautiously peeked inside. It was so strange of him. I picked David up in my arms, not wanting to leave him alone anymore at least until I came to my senses and walked into the woods. I don't know how many of you are parents, but the last thing you want to do when you take your child on a fun weekend is scare them. I mention this because the sensible thing to do would have been to calm him down and ask him to be quiet for a while, but I also realized that in reality it was just a manifestation of imagination. After wandering around the neighborhood for a few minutes with David on my shoulders, I decided to head back to camp. It was about 3.30, I think, and I made us lunch without taking my eyes off the spot where David had been flapping and yapping just a few minutes before. As much as I tried to forget about it, I just couldn't. I'm not superstitious. I don't believe in aliens or ghosts or Bigfoot. But apparently the parental instinct was too much triggered for me to let it go. So as the cold sun was already setting, I decided to ask David a little bit about what he'd seen. To better understand my story, it's probably appropriate to mention that David has a mild learning disability, which has particularly affected his speech. He understands perfectly well, but his ability to communicate is somewhat delayed. As I was building the fire, I asked him about the monkey house. I asked if it was a big monkey. David thought for a moment, then he laughed and nodded. Then I asked if he thought the monkey house was cute, and David chuckled approvingly again. I didn't know what else to ask. Night came, and on a full stomach, I read him a chapter from the book while he fell asleep in his sleeping bag. When I fell asleep myself, I almost forgot about the monkey house. I woke up in pitch darkness. The fire was out. I reached out to feel for David, and panic came over me. He was no longer in the tent. In just my underwear, I jumped outside, but realized it was too dark to see anything, so I scrambled back into the tent and pulled a flashlight out of my bag. I yelled his name at the same time. With the weak beam of the flashlight, which I didn't think I would ever have to rely on, I shined it in a circle, continuing to call out David's name. For some reason, I ran to the spot where David had been so frozen in the afternoon. I shouted his name into the trees. Running deep into the woods, I didn't notice how badly my feet scraped against the bark and rocks. It was only after a minute of walking that I saw something that made me drop the flashlight and rush forward. David stood staring into the darkness, perfectly still. I clung to him tightly and sobbed. Still clutching him tightly to me, I picked up the flashlight again, which was shining idly on the ground and looked around, warding off the darkness. There was nothing to be seen around. As I carried him back, looking over my shoulder, I asked him what was wrong. He replied that he didn't know and that he was tired. David had a long history of sleepwalking. That night I locked the tent from the inside with a padlock. I only managed to get about three hours of rest. David slept like a rock despite my reverent embrace. The next morning I cooked scrambled eggs and bacon on the camp stove. David remembered nothing of what had happened and seemed ready to continue traveling. 
I thought it would be imprudent to write off last night's event as sleepwalking, especially since we were talking about the monkey house, but it would be too stupid to cancel the whole trip because of it. So I promised myself that if anything else happened, we would drive back to Tacoma at any time. The rest of the day passed quite pleasantly and helped to take my mind off things. David was a little bummed at first that he didn't have an iPad, but eventually discovered that nature can be just as cool as pixels. We made some bark boats with faces and let them go with the current, watch squirrels and listen to the birds. It was everything I hoped for on this trip. At dusk, as the trees stretched long shadows across the grass, David was too cold and tired to play any further, and I decided we would spend the rest of the day in the tent. I had brought along a game where you have to circle the outline of a person with an electrode, and if you don't hit it, it makes a funny sound. I can't remember what it's called, but David thought it was funny. It's silly, but supposedly helps develop motor skills. On one of the turns, David made a mistake, and the little speaker made the sound again, and David burst into laughter. What happened next filled me with a sense of dread that hardly anything could match. From about 150 feet away, I heard the exact same laughter as David's, only much deeper. It was as if you had recorded your speech and then digitally reduced it. I froze, and this time I didn't manage to hide my reaction from David. I could tell by the look on his face that he'd heard it too. I put my finger to my lips, signaling that we needed to be quiet. At that moment, I noticed that the sun had completely set. I also noticed that the forest was dead silent. Every second seemed like an eternal minute, as we sat in the tent, completely still, immersed in silence. When finally the pounding of my own heart in my ears quieted a bit, I slowly leaned over to my backpack to retrieve my gun. When I turned to face David, I saw that he had picked up the electrode again. I sternly took it out of his hand and whispered with equal sternness, Not now, David. And then, just as I said it, literally a few centimeters away from the tent, a low, gnarled voice whispered, Not now, David. In the next instant, I realize I'm shooting wildly through the fabric of the tent in the direction of the sound. David screams, and as the shots ring out throughout the forest, I hear the last remnants of something running away. With a trembling hand, I open the padlock and jump outside with a flashlight in my left hand, aiming the faint beam into the black nothingness. I grabbed David, stuffed whatever I had on hand into my backpack, and ran. The way back was pure terror. There wasn't a second that I didn't feel something was right behind us, ready to pop out from behind us or off the side of the trail, out of the darkness. The only thing I could say to David was, It's okay, you'll get an iPad soon. Do you want an iPad? Nothing caught my eye. Nothing could be heard but the sound of the wind and the occasional babbling of the creek on the side of the trail. I was so out of it that even in the car I kept checking the back seat to see if something was sitting there ready to destroy us. I don't know how to explain to David's pediatrician what happened at Mount Rainier. I didn't even tell his mother the whole story, only that I thought someone had approached our tent and I fired a warning shot. Needless to say, David hasn't been the same since. He has a constant headache, which may be due to ear damage from the gunshot. I don't know how to end this story, but one thing is for sure. Never, ever take your children to Mount Rainier National Park. <laughs>